Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at Optimal Plus with Michael Schultenfrey, who's going to talk today about holistic product quality. So, Michael, how do you measure holistic quality? So, when we talk about holistic quality, we're talking about how you uh, ascertain the quality of a device or a product over all of the different manufacturing steps and uh, validation steps that that part uh, goes through. Typically today, when manufacturers are uh, testing their devices, every single test process that they put that device through is a silo. You're not taking data from one uh, insertion and leveraging that data in the next insertion to make more intelligence decision, uh, intelligent decisions. And by missing those uh, decision points, uh, you're actually letting quality issue and reliability issues actually go through with the product and eventually reach a customer. So let's drill down on this. Sure. So, Michael, when you talk about a product, what exactly are you talking about? Well, if you think about the life cycle of a product, um, think of a chip, for example. Okay, a chip starts in a wafer. Uh, you have a die, which then becomes singulated. It then becomes packaged. Very often that package is actually going to contain multiple die, right? There's a uh, significant growth in the amount of uh, devices today. Uh, that are built using multiple dye using uh, advanced packaging solutions. Mm -hmm. That dye eventually is going to get placed uh, on a PCB or on some kind of board. That board is going to be placed in the system and that system is going to be placed in a product. And if you think about it, to really understand the quality of that end product, you need to follow all of the points across that chain from the individual dye all the way to the final uh, product to really be able to ascertain the quality and reliability and, for example, in automotive, even the safety of the device that uh, you're manufacturing. So it's no longer just a chip you're thinking about. You're thinking about the chips with chips, with boards, with systems, and the interaction of all of that, right? Exactly. But if you think about it, there are, there are very uh, many uh, levels in that type of uh, analysis. So if you like, I will start within a single chip and within a single test operation. And we can talk about some of the things that even today, companies aren't necessarily doing when they're looking at the quality of the devices they manufacture. So why don't you draw this out for us? Okay, so let's uh, take, for example, a typical silicon wafer manufacturing process. You're creating a wafer. And the first validation that you do for that wafer when it hits the back end is, let's say, wafer sort one. And wafer sort one is going to consist of a bunch of several hundred or several thousand parametric tests uh, and functional tests. The parametric tests typically are going to come with a set of limits and you're going to measure where within those limits that device is. And of course, if the device is within the limit, it could be here in the middle or here at the edge or, uh, or whatever in any of those locations, that is a good device. Okay. And of course, if it falls outside of the limits, the test program is going to bin out that device uh, as a bad device. Um, now, uh, of course, many uh, companies implement outlier detection on that kind of data. So if this is the distribution of all of those devices within those limits, in other words, most of the devices are here in the middle, and you get a device here out of the edge, standard outlier detection, uh, dynamic uh, part average testing, for example, is going to bin out that device and any devices which are too close to the edge of the uh, distribution. That's not good enough, okay? Because imagine now that I have many, many devices, uh, many, many test measurements, rather, for that particular device. And I have measurements, even though the distributions are similar, I have measurements which are not outliers. In other words, they are within the normal curve of that device, but all of them are sort of borderline in that, uh, on that curve. Now, looking at all of these together, all of a sudden I'm a single device, which is actually quite a marginal one, particularly if from this point on, I'm actually killing all of the outliers. Typically when we thought about outliers in the past, that was good enough. What's changed? Well, the, the thing is that you really need to, to understand the, the overall quality of a device. You need to be looking holistically at all of the test measurements that you're taking on that device and not just at each one of them individually, right? If you think about it, for example, let's say that the uh, uh, distribution of the curves for all of these tests are such that the uh, even values at the edge are not actually outliers, just for the sake of this exercise. Now, I think you'll agree with me that if I were to measure a thousand parameters of this particular device, and I would find that all of the values are right at the edge of the range, right? None of them are nicely located in the uh, center of the distribution. 
From a test program's perspective, this is a good device. Every single measurement here is within the spec limits. But would you want that device controlling the ABS of your car? So how do you factor that into what you're trying to test? So what we do is we take that kind of data and we say, OK, let's look how far each point is from the distribution of that individual parameter. Let's sum all of that together. And let's also, by the way, identify which are the key parameters for us. And based on that, we create something that we call a quality index, which represents how close to the center line of the distribution of every parameter that device is overall. And the quality index typically will be a much better predictor of overall quality and eventual recalls, eventual uh, RMAs uh, that these devices will suffer from once they hit the field. Now you have a quality index at wafer sort one. What happens then? Is that good enough or do you have to go further? Oh no, you have to go a lot further. So uh, think about the fact that I'm now going to have a wafer sort two operation. Let's say this was a measurement that I took at wafer sort two. I'll uh, just uh, clean this up a little bit. Okay. At wafer sort one, I took this measurement here, wafer sort one. Okay, let's say this is, a, I don't know, an Fmax uh, measurement to determine the maximum frequency uh, of a device. And now along comes wafer sort two, and the measurement is taken again, and this time the value is over here. Okay, again, this is a passing test, this is a passing test, the value is within the limits. But once again, if you're seeing this kind of drift in the values, from wafer sort one to wafer sort two, what do you think is going to happen when you test this device at wafer sort three? In all likelihood, it's going to fail again. Drift has been a problem that's cropped up a lot. How do you detect it? Well, this type of drift, in other words, we're talking about performance drift of an individual single device, can be detected by providing historical information from wafer sort one to the test program at wafer sort two. So when wafer sort two makes this measurement, it can take a look at the delta, the change in value between the value measured at wafer sort one and the value measured at wafer sort two. And if necessary, it can decide that that change is too large beyond a certain, uh, a certain limit, and it can kill the device and prevent that device from shipping. We tend to think of this in terms of variation, but what you're talking about here is completely different, right? Yeah, what we're talking about is effectively the impact of latent defects or some kind of process issue or some kind of uh, a change that happened to this particular device as it was moving through the manufacturing uh, process. And it's bad enough when you're talking a bit, uh, along the chain, for example, wafer sort from wafer sort one to wafer sort two. But of course, it becomes much more significant when you then go to final test. And in the middle here, you had a packaging step, which could have created all sorts of problems on, uh, on that device, particularly if you're combining multiple devices together. And it gets even more complicated if from final test, you then move to system level test, or place that chip on a board and then do board level test and so on. So as long as you're capable of remeasuring whatever parameter it is that interests you, you want to be able to go back to the history, the measurement history of that parameter over all of those different previous operations and determine if there has been any significant change in the performance of that parameter. And this continues all the way through the life cycle of this part, right? Because now you're looking at things going, okay, we get data later on, we can now go back and say, Here's where the problem cropped up. This was a latent defect. We need to correct this later on. Exactly. And in fact, what we believe is eventually customers will be tying this into in-use data. So if you can detect this kind of drift going on in a vehicle, for example, uh, you can proactively recall that vehicle and fix that problem before it becomes a serious issue for the customer. So you think about a sensor, if you're, you're sensing how far an object is away from you, in front of you, then if, you're, if that goes awry, you need to come back and say, okay, we've identified this is wrong. Exactly. And if you think about where electronics are going now, in, particularly in automotive uh, applications with uh, uh, so much more electronics going into electrification, into advanced driver assist systems, into autonomous driving, connected cars, and so on, this is all now safety critical. You need to know that this device is going to drift out of range before it happens, because otherwise there could actually be a real liability issue here that the manufacturer absolutely wants to avoid. So what happens when you're 10 years down the road on a car, because cars sometimes last 10, 20 years, and you say, oh, we found a, this is now drifting. Is it just wearing out or is it something that's, that's related back to the manufacturing? 
Well, it's very difficult to know, but if we have over time, if we're able to gather all of this in-use data and correlate it back to the manufacturing data and understand how different manufacturing parameters or different manu ma manufacturing effects are impacting the eventual performance of these devices, we'll be able to build prediction models that will be much better at determining the overall uh, quality of a device and understanding the long-term reliability of that device. And also, by the way, we're working with some of the simulation providers who are uh, taking manufacturing data and leveraging that back to the design phase and the simulation phase uh, so they can see how accurate the simulations really are. Can you get to the point where you can say, oh, we're, this is now an industrial setting. You, you're using this machine. We have a sensor on it. We know when it's going to fail. Um, from, a, uh, from a machine uh, perspective, absolutely yes. Uh, because uh, you know, many um, uh, there are many companies out there today who are doing predictive maintenance applications and so on. They're looking at an individual machine, but typically those things are looking at individual uh, sensors. For example, they're noticing a drift in temperature, or they're noticing a drift in uh, in pressure, or whatever it is that's going on in that machine. What we're talking about here is a totally different level of complexity. It's when you're looking at an individual device over its lifetime and you're understand, trying to understand how all of the different uh, features that impact its performance from the time it was manufactured eventually lead to issues in the field. So in theory that if you have five identical machines but they've all used different chips from different batches, you should be able to identify when one is going to fail versus another one and do predictive uh, maintenance along the way. Well, if you have large enough volume of data and large enough uh, instances with which you can teach a model to correctly identify uh, those changes, then yes, absolutely you can. And what's happened in the past is typically when there are um, flaws in a system, everybody replaces everything. What you're talking about here is much more specific, much uh, more economic ways of approaching those problems. Well, uh, let me take it back a little bit to the way things tend to happen today. And, I'm, and again, let's look at it from the semiconductor device manufacturer, even if that device is eventually going to go into something like an ABS system. So when something fails in the field, that will come as a return back to the manufacturer. And the manufacturer is going to run some kind of evaluation retest of that part to try and determine what went wrong with the device. What we're hearing from customers is that up to 40% of the validations that they're uh, doing, those uh, additional test steps that they're doing on these return parts, come up with no trouble found. In other words, they can't actually work out what is the problem with the device uh, that has been returned. Now, very often though, if we're able to take data from multiple devices on a board or in a system and uh, correlate all of that data together, all of a sudden you can see correlations that do explain the problem. So for example, if they run that chip through a uh, test, all of these results are gonna come out uh, within the uh, passing range, within the limits. However, if we look at the original manufacturing data, we're gonna suddenly see that there was a drift all the way from the right-hand side to the left-hand side of a particular parameter. Now what we can do when we know that that is the signature of the issue that we're seeing, we can now go back and process all of our uh, historic data and identify the individual devices which have that kind of signature and which therefore are candidates for a recall. And now we can do a targeted recall that's only looking for the particular devices uh, that are exhibiting a, a, a problem. But in order to do that, you would need not just the manufacturing data, you would also need the in-use data. In the past when this happened, you typically had a lot of finger pointing of, it's not our problem, it's your problem. This gets beyond that, right? Well, in order for this to really get beyond that, the industry is gonna to have to change the way it approaches sharing data uh, between the different players, because in the end, the chip manufacturer is not the same as the board manufacturer, is not the same as the tier one manufacturer in automotive uh, or the OEM, and, and none of them are prepared to share any data with each other unless they absolutely have to. So uh, we think that bringing in new methods of enabling data sharing between the various players in a way that doesn't ris risk exposing IP or doesn't create uh, some kind of conflict of interest is something that's going to be key. We have some ideas uh, for how to do that using what we call a third party trusted hub and it's something we are uh, promoting very heavily in the industry. We believe that if you can bring all of this data into one place, uh, even uh, under certain types of encryption uh, and correlate it together, you will see signatures and predictive signatures that will enable you to understand and predict failure long before it happens. Where does machine learning fit into this? That's, that gets layered over this, right? 
uh, machine learning fits into this in uh, multiple different places. First of all, uh, obviously, yes, it gets layered over this, and that's because you have, you're talking about uh, multidimensional data here, huge volumes of data, uh, and of course, uh, once you start getting what's called labeling, in other words, you have information about what are the good and bad parts and what's failing in the field, or what are the, the uh, uh, suspect parts in the field, then you can use that, feed that into a machine learning algorithm, and the machine learning algorithm can generate a, a model for you that can enable better prediction. Uh, but machine learning has many other uh, places to fit into the, same, uh, into the same process. For example, even during the manufacturing and assembly processes, we're using machine learning uh, quite heavily um, uh, just to ascertain the quality of uh, every single uh, image that we're able to capture along the manufacturing floor. For example, uh, we've got automotive applications where welding is being used to weld parts together. We're using deep learning uh, on those images to try and determine the quality of the weld, uh, which today is a, uh, a largely a manual process done by uh, operators on a manufacturing floor. And of course, any manual process is going to be prone to significant failure. Michael Sheldon Frey, thanks for a really interesting discussion. Thank you, Ed.